In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. So I'm much more comfortable preaching like this uh, without text, but there are times like this Sunday where the readings have so much in them that I'm a little anxious that I'm not going to be able to connect all the dots. So uh, my inclination is, one, to make this an interactive sermon where you get to raise your hand, but I'm going to invite you at the very end of the church service. If none of this made sense, please stop me because there is so much here that I can only screw it up. Um, uh, It is incredible. the depth that each reading has and how they all tie together. And I hope uh, you all uh, uh, get as geeky about this as I have been over the last uh, several days. Uh, And not only because one of the most famous uh, passages in all of Scripture is included in the Gospel, uh, that John 3.16, that pretty much you don't even have to have the words, uh, just a billboard that says 3.16, not even John, uh, and you know what to expect. That God so loved the world... with. Uh, that he gave his only begotten son to the end, that all that believe in him may not perish, but have eternal life. At 8 o'clock, I could hardly read it in the language uh, that's in today's gospel because that King James Version just rolls off the tongue. Uh, And it it is the gospel inside the gospel. It is a profound truth. But I think one of the dangers is, like any text in Scripture, when we take it out of its context, when we pick it up... uh, we can bend it and make it exactly what we want it to be. I think one of the dangers that we do with John 3.16 is that we make it a little bit too easy, uh, that we trust in a God who did all the work for us and that we are promised through that God that loves us, which is true, uh, the gates to eternal life. We're done. Our job is done. God has done it all for us. But I think there's a lot more to the reading. And there's a lot more to our Christian faith and our discipleship that are wrapped in these texts. And I think we have to go back a little bit further to see it. That it's not just enough uh, that we are children of the light through Jesus who saved us, uh, but that we are called to bring our entire lives out into the light and live as part of that life. That's what Ephesians reminds us. Yes, we are saved by grace, uh, but that grace... Uh, compels us to be the people we were created to be, that we were made to do good works, that we don't do good works uh, to receive uh, the key to heaven. We do good works because we've received the light, we've brought our lives into the light, we've acknowledged all the places where we've fallen short, and we become children of the light. We become Christ's hands and feet, agents of that light and that grace to the world. It's what we were made to be. It's written right there. It's how we were created to be. But what does John mean? It's funny that everybody knows John 3.16. I shouldn't say everybody, but most of us are familiar with John 3.16. But if I asked you, remember that time where Jesus compares himself to a serpent? Almost everybody would have a blank stare. Just two verses before, in 3.14, Jesus says, like that serpent that Moses lifted up, I shall be lifted up. The Son of Man will be lifted up. He compares himself to that serpent. We'll go back to that story. Uh, But this whole passage takes place in the context of Nicodemus at the beginning of this chapter uh, in John. Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night. Nicodemus is a religious leader with a whole lot to lose. If what Jesus is saying is true, he can lose his power his position in the church, his way of life. But there is something so compelling about what this man preaches, about what this man teaches, about what this man has done with his life, uh, that Nicodemus knows there is truth in it. And so he comes at night to inquire more. He thirsts so much for that truth. And Jesus tells him that in order for him uh, to receive eternal life, that he needs to be born again, that he needs to be transformed Uh, And he struggles with what that means. Uh, What does it mean to be born again? And then Jesus goes on to tell this passage. That I must be raised up like Moses raised up that serpent. So now we have to go even farther back. Through the pages of John all the way back to Numbers. So what are we talking about? Well, Moses uh, was in the wilderness with the people of Israel and they're getting tired. They've been in the wilderness some time. 
uh, and that wonderful gift of manna that fell from the heavens uh, when they were starving and, uh, and were losing faith. Uh, the, that manna that the Bible describes in so many ways, uh, tasting savory, uh, like coriander or like honey or like olive oil, uh, you know, that this manna from heaven that they cooked all these different ways that was such a blessing has started to taste like dirt. They've been in the wilderness so long uh, that it's just not sufficing anymore. And they're tired and they're frustrated and they're losing faith. And so they're whining and complaining, and they're saying, uh, this food, it's miserable. It doesn't fill us. We miss the food we had in Egypt, the scraps uh, that we were handed as slaves in Egypt. Why were we taken out here? Um, and God uses the image of the serpent. Why? Now we've got to go back even farther in Scripture. We've got to go back to the very beginning, that story of the fall, where the serpent tempts Eve, and then is punished. Remember, uh, is punished to no longer have any feet, to crawl on its belly, and that everything it ever eats will taste like dust. So for the Jewish people, uh, when they have this image of uh, the serpents uh, that, that God punishes them with, God punishes them with serpents, and the serpents come, uh, and they bite uh, the, uh, the disenchanted uh, Israelites, and they begin to die, uh, and the cure, the anti-serum, when Moses begs for his people's mercy, uh, is that that staff uh, is to be made in the shape of a serpent. And when their eyes look at the serpent, when they acknowledge uh, that they've become the serpent, that, uh, that what used to taste like grace uh, now tastes like dust, that they have, uh, they've become like the serpent, uh, when they acknowledge that truth in themselves, when they see that light, they'll be restored to life. And that's the image that Jesus uses to talk about the cross, the image of a serpent. Two weeks ago when I was preaching and I was talking about uh, the shootings in, in, in Parkland, Florida and all the things going on in this world, uh, it occurred to me right in the middle of my sermon uh, that the cross is that collision, that violent collision between the world we live in and God's vision of what could be. God's love for us and God's deepest desire for us to live in a different truth, in a different reality, and the world we live in colliding together. And it's so uh, fully a collision uh, that the whole world trembles. The skies turn dark, the world trembles, and that sheet that covers the dis difference between the world that God created and the world that God dreams for all of us uh, is pull pulled back. That we see for a minute the other side, what could be. That the cross is that collision, and we are called to look directly at it. That we're called to look at our brokenness, to bring that brokenness out into the light uh, and acknowledge the fact that we've made mistakes, that we don't have it right. And that's one of the things that we have the opportunity to do during this season of light, is to pull those things that we are not particularly proud of out from the shadows and into the light. One of the beautiful things about this story. When you think about um, uh, a snake bite, a poisonous snake bite, the anti-venom is made from the venom itself. They take the venom and they put it into an animal and the animal creates antibodies and the antibodies are used to make the anti-venom. But Jesus realizes that part of our healing, part of our ability to walk as children of the light is to acknowledge the darkness, is to acknowledge our brokenness. To offer that in front of God, not so that it's forgotten, but so that it's healed and becomes part of who we are when we walk as children of the light. And yes, we are saved by grace. Yes, God so loved the world that he gave his only son to the end that all that believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. But that compels us, that transforms us into people of light. To walk differently. To walk boldly. And when we come to the table, and we eat Christ's body and Christ's blood. The things that we've done to one another, the pain that we've caused one another, the hurt that we're capable of doing, becomes what we eat and what we drink. The anti-venom, or the venom that too often is cast uh, upon one another. And as we receive it, we not only acknowledge our brokenness, but we receive that healing power 
so that we truly can become what we were made to be, children of the light. Amen.